All right. Can everyone see? All right. So this is chapter eight, walk through two, um, taking on a K through 12 work grade book. So the topics emphasized is tidying, transforming, visualizing, and modeling. And functions introduced is uh, remove empty from janitor, contains from string R, and core, and some vocabulary words. <laughs> uh, just let me know if you have any questions on anything you see. So uh, chapter overview. So we're going to go over the classroom grade book. Um, uh, we'll go ahead and use data science tools and techniques and focus more on analysis, including correlations and linear models. And the background is this uh, uses uh, this grade book data is common, but is often ignored um, for uh, typically statewide tests are, are analyzed more than grade books are, but um, it's an important untapped source and uh, can potentially reveal um, um, some good insights. So the data sources, um, the file is from the books GitHub. Um, when I share this, uh, has the link to it in the presentation. Uh, but go ahead, let me know if you need that link shared in the chat or anything. Uh, the methods using a linear model, uh, which relates to one or more X or independent variables to a Y or dependent variable and correlation analysis. All right, loading packages. So for this walkthrough, uh, we need tidyverse here, read Excel, uh, and that's to read and import Excel spreadsheets, not just CSV. And janitor um, provides a number of functions related to cleaning and preparing data. And of course, our data EDU. All right, so when we, after we download the Excel file, uh, here's kind of just a snippet uh, so we can see that our column headers don't start until uh, row 11. Um, and we have some columns like race, gender, age, et cetera, that don't have anything in there. Uh, so it's, it's pretty messy. Um, So there are two different ways covered in this walkthrough of importing the data. Uh, the first is using a file path. Um, so we can use the function git uh, wd to see what our current working directory is. And this is just mine uh, that you can see here. Um, and so this code uh, uses the read Excel, which reads and saves from an Excel spreadsheet. Um, and we save it to an object that we call Excel gradebook. And we use these two arguments uh, in this sh uh, sheet equals one and skip equals 10. And so in this Excel spreadsheet, we actually have like five different sheets. 
And that first 10 rows contain things we don't need. So sheet equals one tells read Excel to just read the first sheet in the file and disregard the rest. And then skip equals 10 tells read Excel to skip reading the first 10 rows of the sheet and start reading from row 11, which is where the column headers and data actually start inside the Excel file. And uh, please note that the above path is unique to my machine and will not work for you. <laughs> so please adjust the path to match the specifics of your file location. And you may have noticed that the path I used does not match my working directory. Uh, when I downloaded the file, it automatically went to my downloads folder, which is not in my working directory. Uh, so one benefit of using the path, uh, this path option is that the file does not need to be located in my working directory to be imported. Um, however, there's a big con to this that I will explain next. So we can also import using here. Um, this uses the root directory. Um, so we will need to make sure that the file is located there. So I made a copy of the file from my downloads. Um, but actually, I first moved it, which then broke my R markdown earlier. So in this case, I copied it <laughs> so that I don't break my previous example. And um, so I moved it to my root directory. And but a really good reason to use this method over the path method is that it makes our code uh, reproducible uh, when we share with others or even when we individually use a different computer. Um, instead of needing to edit the code itself, uh, everything will run without edits as long as all of the files are located in the current root directory. Um, and for more information, uh, again, my, my uh, there's an article by Jenny Bryan that's that's really uh, funny. She talks about how she's going to set your computer on fire <laughs> because uh, when she was working with um, students projects that she'd have to go in and manually edit the, pi the path every time because it was moving from their computer to her computer and how annoying that is. Um, so I highly recommend you check out that article. Uh, so here's, here's our code using here. Uh, again, we use the argument sheet equals one and skip equals 10. Um, and in my root directory, it's under the folder chapter eight. So that's where my here chapter eight comma and then the file. And now we have imported it into our studio. Um, so now we're going to give it a new name uh, just so this this lowercase grade book is easier to uh, type in uh, when we're referencing it over and over and over again throughout this uh, walkthrough. And um, the other benefit is that when we are making our edits to gradebook, um, if we make mistakes and mess it up, uh, we can just use, we can just um, use this code again to uh, start fresh with gradebook because we have this extra copy, the, the original copy just hanging around in our environment. Okay, um, so now let's look at our data frame that we have in here. So this is not all of it, it cuts off, but we can see all of these NAs. Um, we can see the, the column names uh, are, have spaces and that, that's not gonna work very well. So 
um, it's not tidy. Uh, we could uh, have messed with the Excel sp spreadsheet before we read it in, um, deleting rows and columns we don't need and renaming the column uh, headers. But um, if we did that, that means if we ever encountered this uh, file again, or files that are in a similar format that we're going to run this analysis on, uh, we'd have to redo all that manual labor that we just did on it. Uh, so it's recommended to clean the original data in R so that we can um, just use our code if we have this for whatever reason, we get the same file over again and have to start fresh or um, say we get past years or years going forward or other teachers are all using the same format. Uh, we already have our code to clean that all up and we don't need to be messing around uh, in Excel to clean it up. So next we're gonna use janitor it has many handy functions to clean. Uh, we have clean names, get dupes, and do you say it table? I, I've never actually heard anyone say it. I've just read about it. So uh, if anyone wants to just un unmute and tell me how I'm supposed to be saying that, and feel free to at any time unmute and correct me if I'm saying things wrong. Um, so clean names, it takes messy column names that have periods, capitalized letters, spaces, et cetera, and cleans them up into our friendly column names. So typically that's all lowercase with underscores, uh, get dupes, identifies the duplicate records so that you can examine them and uh, see what the potential issues are. And this, uh, table uh, is really cool. It uh, tabulates data in the data frame and can be uh, adorned with adorned functions. Uh, we don't really go over that in this walkthrough, but I'm sure we will in future walkthroughs. Oh. All right, so let's look at our column names. Uh, oh, I see the chat. Yes, I used, I used, I used janitor, uh, but I just recently found out about it like a couple of weeks ago. But uh, again, uh, I've actually mostly used it for the, the table. Um, but I wish I could share my data. I think that is the downfall. I, I don't know about the rest of you, but for me, all of my work is private student data. So I can't just show my work because <laughs> it's private. Um, but yeah, I, I really like janitor, um, but it is relatively new to me, but I, I really like the functions on there. So the, that output is too long for our slide. It keeps going, um, but we can use head to just look at the, the first 10. So the, here's our original column names. As you can see, it has spaces, has capital letters. Um, and now we're going to use janitors clean names and that's all we need to do. We take our data frame, we pipe in, uh, we say, and then clean names, and then we we can examine our names and bam, all lowercase, replace that space with an underscore, and that's much better. And this is just to uh, show again, uh, just a little bit more repeated grades, financial status, make your own categories, um, so it looks a bit cleaner, but there are still some things we can remove. So uh, let's remove 
column. So remove empty from janitor, uh, removes columns, rows, or both that have no information in them. So um, this is our data frame as it is right now. And so if we remove empty columns, I don't know if you can see the, the tibble at the top, we have 33 by 63, and now we have 33 by 55. And you can see that race, gender, age, repeated grades, et cetera, all go away. And we can also do empty rows. Now you don't see exactly what happens here, except for you can see up here the, the tibble summary. Uh, it was 33 rows, and now we only have 25 rows. Uh, which is good because we only have 25 students. And then uh, just for this example, I assigned it to gradebook. So again, here's the little first five observations of gradebook, um, a snippet of it anyway. And so now all our NAs are gone, which is great. And um, Yeah, so I, I, I've been retraining myself to use snake case um, because that's uh, typically Python and R users use snake case. Uh, I, I'm trying to get away from camel case. That's what I learned because uh, I learned C++ and C++ is camel case. <laughs> so, but I, I've been trying to discipline myself since I, I, I did that in school and I'm really not using C++ anymore. So I'm trying to discipline myself more to a snake case to be consistent. Um, so now that we have the empty rows and columns removed, uh, we notice that there are two columns, absent and late, uh, where uh, the person using this spreadsheet uh, started putting data in, but then decided to give that up. So um, as you can see, absent and late, there, there's one here, one here, two here, and then um, as far as I know, the rest are zeros. They're just like, yeah, I'm just not going to do that, um, which fair enough. But because of this, we're, we want to remove it because it doesn't give us anything uh, useful. So, but they weren't removed by the remove empty because there was stuff in it. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and use select to remove it. We'll use negative signs to say we want everything but these two. And so we have our data frame. And then if we select uh, negative absent and negative late. It takes those out. As you can see, class name, absent late, running average, and now we just have class name and running average. Took that as out, and then we assigned it to gradebook. So um, again, oh. Just want to say something that I found interesting on the, that I came across on the select. You know how you do like minus absent, minus late? You can actually do, I'll put it in the chat. You can do it a different way that I came across and it still works. So instead of like putting all those minuses in there, you can just concatenate them all together. And that's something that I found like very, cause then you can combine it with like the other function of like everything. And then like, it, it, I, I find it more easier to understand and organize when you do it that way. If you got like multiple variables or columns you want to select, I don't know. So uh, we're going to create a new data frame called uh, classwork data frame. Selects particular variables from gradebook and then uh, using select and then finally gathers the homework data into new columns. So we're going to use the package string R. Um,
uh, and we'll use the Morgan, I think your mic is going in and out. I can't hear you right now. Oh, no. Do you hear me better now? Yes. OK. <laughs> I, I have, um, for my headset, I, I have another mute button on here. And I think I sat on it. So sorry about that. Thanks for letting me know. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, Zaringa, I've never watched Naruto, so I Naruto, so I I don't know exactly how to pronounce it, but yes, that's Zar Zaringan. <laughs> I don't know, but yes, that that's what I'm using. Um, so uh, this function searches any column with the string classwork underscore. Um, so that we can capture classwork one all the way to classwork 17. Um, and then pivot longer transforms the data set into tidy, da tidy data, where each variable forms a column, each observation forms a row, and each type of observational unit forms a table. And I just did this for a work project just like last week, the pivot longer and pivot wider, it's so cool. Uh, very, very useful, would take forever without it. <laughs> um, so, uh, and then note the scores are in character format and we use mutate to transform them to numeric. So we have our grade book. Uh, we're going to just select um, some of the columns, but not all. You can see that we originally had uh, 53 uh, columns, and now we're just selecting 25. And then we're mutating. Uh, if, if you can see right here, at least that's where I see it, the, the classwork three says character, and now it's a double with mutate. And then unfortunately, my, my flipbook R doesn't do this last part, but then we pivot longer. So um, pivot longer doesn't really work on displaying it in the slides, but uh, a little bit of just a, the first seven observations you can see is now student one, student one, student one, student one, student one, because it's going through this classwork number, classwork one, classwork two, classwork three, classwork four. Um, so it has made our data frame longer. All right, so now we're going to visualize data. Um, so we can do a summary, uh, but this is, this cuts off on my slide, but this is, this is kind of ugly and no one wants to look at this, honestly. So we're going to use ggplot2 to graph some of the data to help us um, see what this data looks like. So we'll use ggplot2 to graph the categorical val variables into a bar graph. And um, here we can see the variable letter grade is plotted on the x-axis showing the counts of each letter grade on the y-axis. So here we have our data frame and um, ggplot. And we layer on top our bar graph and we add our, we add our labels. And then we use our data edu uh, colors and theme. And that's, that's that. And we make a, another graph with ggplot2 uh, using the classwork data frame from earlier. Um, 
we can see the distribution of scores and how they differ um, from classwork to classwork using box plots. Um, so we have our, our classwork data frame. We're setting up our ggplot. We add our box plot for each one. Um, add our labels. We do our data edu fill. We do our data edu theme. And then um, take away our legend and we tilt our x axis so that we can actually read these down here. So this is a really useful because we can see right that a classwork 11 um, really high scores on this but um, you know classwork 12 and classwork 17 um, had a bigger distribution. All right so now Moving on to model data, uh, we can start to form. Yeah, I agree. Uh, it's I was just following the book, but I I probably wouldn't have color coded them either, and probably took take the time to order them. I I think that would be worthwhile, but yeah, I I wouldn't color them either. Um. But I, I think it was probably more just to show us the that ggplot2 can. <laughs> um, that's a good question. I haven't really thought about this, but I would think there's an easy way to say um, capture after the underscore and then convert that to numeric and then order it that way. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know if these were read in as factors or not. I guess that that's another thing is uh, just looking at that read. Um, yeah, I don't know if there's a way for, okay. Well, we'll have to check that out, Ryan. Reorder within. But good question. So uh, now we're going to form, we're going to start to form a hypothesis about the data. So we can ask ourselves, can we predict overall grade by using formative, formative assessment scores? Um, so for this, we will try to predict a response variable y, which is the overall grade. As a function of a predictor variable x, the formative assessment scores. And the goal is to create a mathematical equation for overall grade as a function of formative assessment scores when only formative assessment scores are, are known. Um, so. We're going to visualize the data to see um, any distributions, trends, or patterns before building a model. And um, so then first we'll plot x and y to determine if we can see a linear relationship between the predictor and response. The x-axis shows the formative assessment scores while the y-axis shows the overall grades. Uh, the graph suggests a correlation between overall class grade and formative assessment scores. As the formative assessment, uh, formative scores go up, the overall grade goes up too. So we have our grade book. Uh, we're setting up our plot and um, adding our scatter plot. And then the add our labels. And then our data edu theme. So as you can see, that as the formative assessment score goes up, uh, the overall grade um, seems to go up 
as well. So we can layer different types of plots on top of each other in ggplot2. Uh, so we'll show a scatter plot layered with a line of best fit, suggesting a positive linear relationship. So again, we have our data frame. We set up our ggplot. Uh, we add our scatter plot on top, and then we add our uh, line, our linear line on top. And SE equals true is the a standard error, and we can see that it's a positive, oops, a positive relationship. And we add our labels and then our theme. All right, so outliers. Uh, now we use box plots to determine if there are any outliers in formative assessment scores or overall grades. As we would like to conduct a linear regression, we're hoping to see no outliers in the data. So we have our data frame. Uh, we set up our ggplot and we add our box plot and our labels and then our theme. So we can see on here, um, don't see any outliers on this box plot. We'll do this again for scores, uh, grade scores. So our data frame, setting up ggplot, putting our box plot on, adding our labels, and adding our theme. And we see on this box plot, uh, don't see any outliers on that either. So we don't see any for these two variables, so we can proceed with the model. So correlation analysis, we want to know the strength of the relationship between the two variables, uh, formative assessment scores and overall grade percentage. The strength is denoted by the correlation coefficient. The correlation coefficient goes from negative one to one. If one variable consistently increases with the increasing value of the other, they have a positive correlation towards one. If one variable consistently decreases with the increasing value of the other, then you have a negative correlation towards negative one. If the correlation coefficient is zero, then there is no relationship between the two variables. So in our case, our correlation coefficient is uh, 0.66, which is positive and definitely not zero. So, uh, but it is important to remember that correlation is a good, is good for finding relationships, but it does not imply that one variable causes the other. And I, I don't know if you've heard it as much as I have, the correlation does not mean causation, um, but it is a good mantra to remember. Uh, so now our results. Now that we've checked our assumptions and seen a linear relationship, we can build a linear model. A mathematical formula that calculates your running average as a function of our formative assessment score. This is done by using the LM function, where the arguments are our predictor, which is formative assessments, our response, which is running average, and the data, which is gradebook. Uh, LM is available in base R, that is no additional packages beyond what is loaded with R automatically are necessary. So here we have R calculate our linear model, and then we call the summary and we can see the, um, uh, essentially like the, the box plot of our residuals and um, our coefficients. So we have our, our intercept here at 50.1. Um, 
and yeah, so gives us some more detail on that. And when we fit a model to two variables, we create an equation that describes the relationship between those two variables based on their averages. This equation uses the intercept, which is 50.11511, and the coefficient for formative assessments, which is 0.42136. The equation reads like this. Our running average equals 50.1 plus 0 0.42 times formative assessments. We interpret these results by saying for every one unit increase in formative assessment scores, we can expect a 0.4 to 1 unit increase in running average scores. This equation estimates the relationship between formative assessment scores and running average scores in the student population. So if you were describing the formative assessment system to stakeholders, you may say something like, we can generally expect our students to show a 0.4 to one increase in their running average score for every one point increase in their formative assessment scores. That makes sense because your goal is to, to explain what happens in general but we can rarely expect every prediction about individual students to be correct, even with a reliable model. So when using this equation to inform how you support an individual student, it's important to consider all the real life factors, visible and invisible, that influence an individual student outcome, creating residuals. Uh, residuals are the differences between predicted values and actual values that aren't explained by your linear model equation. So the conclusion, uh, we first imported our data, then we cleaned and transformed it. Once we had the data in a tidy format, we were able to explore the data using data visualization before modeling the data using linear regression. Uh, if we ran this analysis for someone else, uh, say a teacher or an administrator, we might be interested in sharing the results in a form of uh, a report or document. Uh, thus, the only remaining step in this analysis would be to communicate our findings. And I recommend using a tool such as R Markdown. It provides the functionality to easily generate reports that include both text as well as the code and the output that are displayed together in a single document. And that can be PDF, Word, HTML, and other formats. Um, and that's the end. I used uh, the flipbook portion of this presentation was created with the new flipbook R package. And you can download it at Eva May Ray's GitHub. And this is my R markdown of the chapter. Um, but if you're not using our, mark, uh, our markdown yet, I highly, highly recommend it because I, it just makes things so much easier. And this doesn't actually cut off like my slides did. You can actually slide all the way out to see. <laughs> So are there any questions? I had one about interpreting the analysis that was done here. Um, so I believe looking at the Excel file that uh, the formative assessment score is actually a component of the overall grade. And we're looking at the relationship between those two. So I don't think it would be right to say that it's a confounding here because we're not talking about a causal 
relationship, but does that affect how you would interpret the um, the analysis or the relationship between the two? That is a good question. I, to be honest, I didn't look too closely at this. I should have, so. I pulled up the Excel file and it looked like, you know, the calculation of the of the running grade was drawing on the formative. Does anyone whose statistics is more recent um, than me have thoughts about how that would influence your interpretation? Okay. So, so just to be clear, your question is formative, you're saying formative assessment is a part of the overall grade? Yeah. That's what you're saying. I'm dealing with another grade book situation in my professional life in which the uh, psychometrician I'm working with is very concerned about situations where people uh, use, you know, a grade early in the semester as a predictor of the final grade and, and who interpret it incorrectly, you know, or at least you know, don't account for the fact that it's, it's not independent of the final grade, but it's actually a um, part of it, right? Uh, and I think like the correlation analysis here, that's not really a problem for. Um, I can't actually remember whether it's an issue in the regression analysis and none of the interpretations that people made or that they put forward were, were making causal claims. And so I think it's the biggest issue if you're talking about causal uh, um, analysis, but somehow I still feel strange about, um, you know, about doing that analysis without at least examining what's being, um, what's being said here, yeah. I, I can't remember, <laughs> um, it's been yeah, a long time. I'm pretty sure that's one of like the five major assumptions of a uh, linear regression. Like you're saying, this is we're looking at the correlation between the two, and then the other thing I guess is con is contextual, right? So like let's let's say you're working with the teacher just to see if there's a relationship between the two. I think it would be fine, but if you're running the you know the regression for some other yeah, I, I part of me wondered if they were looking at this in kind of an exploratory spirit or something, and and not worrying too much about it. But I I was hoping for a little bit of discussion of you know what assumptions they were making. I think Ryan corrected me there. The ears have to be independent. All right. Thank you for asking. I'm sorry, I don't have the answer. Uh, yeah, statistics. It's uh, it's been a very long time for me. So. <laughs>